What is going on everyone, my name is Kodamore and welcome back to Electronics episode 24. In this episode we will be covering integrated circuits and specifically the 555 timer integrated circuit today. And I'm very, very, very excited to be making this episode because today we are finished with all of the boring stuff that we just learned in the previous tutorials. We are taking our very first steps into the things that we're going to need to really, really know in making an 8-bit computer. This is going to be really exciting, so let's get to it. Now, an IC is short for an integrated circuit, and it is a circuit that is packaged on or essentially placed within a very, very small piece of semiconductive material, or more basically, it is a circuit that is made to be very, very small. Now, most ICs that you're going to see look either like this or this here. Now, this first IC that you can see here is an integrated circuit that has DIP packaging, or a dual inline packaging, DIP. Basically, it has pins, as you can see here, that can be easily accessed and placed into a breadboard, for example. And the other common type of IC packaging is called surface mount packaging, and that is what you can see right here. Now, these are both the exact same IC, just they're in different packaging. And surface mount packages like this chip right here are usually used more at the production level for mass-produced circuits, rather than prototyping because the pins are so much smaller. Now, because of this, any IC that you purchase for the most part will likely want to be a dual inline package IC, or it should look something like this with the longer pins that you're able to easily access and put into a breadboard. Now, ICs have many different functions, of course. They all do something completely different, and we'll be discussing many of them as we go on with this tutorial series, but one of the most popular ICs that you should first learn about in electronics is probably going to be the 555 timer IC, or the triple five timer. And this IC has been used for many, many years. And it has many different uses, but today we will be using it to create an oscillating circuit like we did in the previous video. However, it'll be much more controllable, accurate, and stable compared to the circuit that we built last time. Now, the triple five timer IC, which I have right here, as well as the previous two ICs that you just saw, has eight pins. In this example, you can see four of them on the front here, and there are also four of them on the other side of this. Now, whenever you are working with an IC, the pins are numbered, and they are numbered counterclockwise starting at the upper left pin. And you can tell what pin is the upper left because every IC will usually have a small little indentation like this one does right here at the upper left, so we know that this is pin number one. Or if that's not the case, it'll have a little indentation on the top part right here, which you can kind of see right there, and that indicates the top of the chip so that we know this pin should be number one as well. And this IC just happens to have both of those, the, both the dimple and the little dot here. But some ICs may only have one of those. They all look a little bit different. And like I said, the pins on an IC are numbered counterclockwise. So in the case of a 555 timer, pin 1 is connected to ground, or essentially the negative terminal of your battery, and pin 8 is called VCC here, or essentially where you're going to connect the positive terminal of your battery to. Now, in the case of most other ICs, the bottom left pin will usually be your ground pin, while the upper right pin will usually be your VCC or your positive terminal pin. But of course, all ICs are different, so it's very important to have the data sheet for the IC that you are working with in front of you to know what all the pins mean and what they should be connected to. For example, if you accidentally connect VCC and ground backwards, you could badly damage the IC chip. So I know the names of each one of these pins just because I looked at the data sheet for the 555 timer. Now I'm going to begin by drawing out the circuit, building it, and then seeing it work, and then I will go through a very detailed explanation of how everything works in the 555 timer. Now we are going to use the 555 timer today in what is called a stable mode, and the 555 timer can go in three modes. You have a stable, mono stable, and then I'm going to write the other one down here, there's also by stable mode as well. So we are going to be making a circuit that runs the triple five timer in a stable mode, meaning that the output pin will be a constant cycle. So essentially, from the output pin here, that is where our oscillation is going to be. It's going to be off for a few seconds, it'll turn on for a few seconds, off again, on again, off again, on again, in this square wave pattern. And of course, it's going to do that automatically, just like the circuit we built in the last video. Now, it can also be run in what is called monostable mode, where some sort of trigger, like a button press, will cause the output to go on and then off for a set amount of time. And there is also bistable mode, but we won't be talking about monostable or bistable mode at this moment. We are just going to make a circuit that closely resembles the circuit that we had in the last video, but of course it's going to be much better and more accurate and stable. 
So let me begin by drawing the schematic diagram here. First we're going to start out with our battery. This is of course the positive terminal of the battery and that will be hooked up to VCC and from the positive terminal of the battery we will have a resistor here and I'll give you the values of these resistors in just a few moments and that resistor will be connected to pin number seven or the discharge pin of the IC and from there after that resistor we will have another resistor hooked up here and this resistor will be connected to the threshold pin, pin number six of the 555 timer. And I should actually probably label this IC, that way we know what it is, the 555 timer. And from here, we will actually have this go to the trigger pin, pin number two of the IC, and we will also have it go to a capacitor right here. And that capacitor, the other side, will just be connected to ground. I'm just going to write GND, that way I don't have to make a connection all the way up to the negative terminal of the battery. Great. Now the control voltage, pin number 5, is just going to have a capacitor on it, and that capacitor will be connected to ground as well. The reset pin, pin number 4, is going to be connected directly to the positive terminal of the battery, or VCC. Again, instead of making a wire connection up there, I'm just going to write VCC so that we know where it goes. Ground will of course be connected to the negative terminal of the battery here, and then we will have our output pin which actually has our oscillating signal, and we'll connect that to a different circuit like a blinking light or something. So actually, let's have this output pin jump over this wire, and we can just lead this on up to, I don't know, say a resistor here, and that resistor will just lead to an LED so that we can get a blinking light, and the LED will be connected to the negative terminal of the battery. So I know this is a really messy schematic symbol, but this is what we want to build on our breadboard. Now this capacitor right here connected to control voltage, I'm going to make that a 0.1 nanofarad capacitor. Really this can be any value capacitor, but you probably just want a very small value. So don't worry too much about the actual value of this one. Now for this other capacitor here, as you can see I drew an electrolytic symbol here because I want a slightly larger value. You can use a value such as a 100 microfarad capacitor. In my case I'm going to be using a 470 microfarad capacitor. And essentially, the larger the capacitance value right here, the lower your frequency is going to be, or essentially, your light is going to blink slower with the larger the capacitance that you have. So you can experiment around and try different values for this capacitor here if you would like. And then the two resistors will actually will make them 4.7k ohm resistors. So this one will also be a 4.7k ohm resistor as well. Again, you don't have to use exact values, it can be a bit different of course, and I should probably mention that I will be using a 9 volt power source, which means that your resistor over here will have to be of a large enough value, that way your LED won't burn out. So in my case, I'm just going to approximate, I'm just going to use a 1 kilo ohm uh, resistor here, because I'm just assuming that that's not going to make my LED burn out or anything, it should resist enough electricity for that all to work. So there we go, that is what we will be using to make our circuit, let's build it, run it, and then we will go into a full on in-depth explanation about it. So I'm not going to go through and build the entire circuit on camera, you should be able to see most of the connections here, all I have to do is add two more resistors and this circuit will be completed along with our schematic that we made. As you can see I have my 470 microfarad capacitor, my 0.1 nanofarad capacitor, like I said this one isn't required, but you probably want to have it, it's good practice to do so. I have my triple five timer chip and if I zoom into it a bit more here, you should be able to slightly see on the top here there's a little indent. And I'm sorry that it's hard to see on the camera, but that is how I know it's the top of the chip and that this pin is the upper left pin or pin number one. So it's important that you make sure that your triple five timer chip is oriented the proper direction. And the same goes for everything like the LED, make sure that's hooked up correctly. I have my resistor here. Everything should be hooked up properly. Let me just go ahead and I'm going to take my two 4.7 kilo ohm resistors. One is going to go from pin 8 to pin 7. And you want to make sure that you don't have any weird connections touching each other accidentally. And the next is going to go from pin 7 to pin number 6. So let me put that in right now as well. So my circuit looks very, very messy, especially up here. That's probably why you're going to want to spread out all your connections a bit more. But who has time for that? I certainly don't. So let's actually hook up the power and get this thing running. So once I connect the 9 volt battery, the LED instantly turns on, and then after a couple of seconds, it should turn off for us, and it'll turn back on, as you can see, and it's going to continue to blink. And later on in this video, I show you how to calculate the frequency of how this light is turning on and off. But anyways, this is the circuit in action, so let's go into an explanation of all of this. 
Now this is probably going to be the biggest explanation that I have ever done this far in this series. There is a lot of stuff that I have to explain here, and there's also a lot of things within the triple five timer that we haven't talked about yet that I also have to explain. Now it can be a really tricky thing to understand, so if you get really really confused, don't worry about it, follow along with the series, maybe come back to this video. It can be quite tough to understand, and I'm going to try my best to explain it the best I possibly can. Now there's this thing within the triple five timer called a flip flop. I've drawn it so that it looks kind of like a switch, but it's really not a physical switch in the triple five timer, but I just drew it that way because it's easier to show how it functions. So there isn't an actual physical switch within here. Second of all, we see that there are these two little triangle things in here, and those two triangle things are called comparators right here. We have not talked about comparators yet, so let's do a brief little introduction into what the comparators are going to be doing within the triple five timer. So we have two inputs, the top is called the V plus input, the bottom is called the V minus input, and then coming out of the tip of the triangle we have the output signal. And actually, before I continue on with this explanation, I have to explain two words that I'm going to be using throughout the remainder of this series. I'm going to be using the words high and I'm also going to be using the word low quite a bit. Whenever I say high, it means that there is voltage. We are connected to the positive rail, it's sending out voltage on this wire, or this is essentially equivalent to the number one, meaning we do have voltage. Whenever I use the word low, I mean we don't have any voltage, or we're connected to ground, zero volts in fact. And this is also equivalent to the number zero, you'll see that a lot. So high, we are sending out voltage on whatever wire we're talking about. Low means we are not sending out voltage, instead we are connected to ground on that wire. Those are two very important words that we're going to be using throughout the remainder of this series. High is voltage, low is no voltage or ground. Okay, back to comparators right here. Now I've written down exactly what happens here in these two lines. So what we are saying is that the output signal here, the output, will be high or it will connect to VCC to positive voltage and it will send out positive voltage only if the V plus input is greater than the V minus input. So if we have more voltage coming into the plus input than we do coming into the minus input, then the output will become high and it will send out positive voltage for us. However, and I also have this written down next to it over here, the output will be low or connected to ground if the V plus input is less than the V minus input. So if the voltage coming into the plus input is less than the voltage coming into the minus input, the output will be low connected to ground. That is what a comparator does. And I'm going to leave this text on the screen uh, right up here, that way that you can refer to it as I'm explaining things because it is a very key part of the triple five timer, of course. Now that those basic explanations are out of the way, let's get to how this is working. So the first thing that we are gonna notice is that the VCC and ground pins are connected by three resistors in series here. And these three resistors actually split up our input voltage. So going to comparator A here is going to be one third of our supply voltage, one third of our VCC while this wire going down to comparator B to the minus input is going to be two-thirds of our input voltage, two-thirds of our VCC. Now I used a 9 volt battery so instead of writing that I'm just gonna say that constantly we are getting to the plus input of this comparator three volts because that is one-third of my 9 volt supply and to the minus input of the B comparator we are getting six volts because that is two thirds of my power supply. And that's pretty much gonna stay constant. We will always be comparing something to three volts here and something to six volts down here. Now really the only tough part that I have to explain is this control voltage pin here, which as you can see is also connected to this minus input. Basically, don't worry about this control voltage pin for now, because all in all, it's pretty much just connected to ground constantly. And the only reason that we have this capacitor here is just to smooth out the input. That way we have a nice smooth voltage going into this comparator. That's the only reason we have this capacitor here, and the control voltage pin also helps set the sensitivity of the triple five timer. But again, for this basic explanation, and because we just have this connected to ground essentially, imagine that this control voltage pin is doing nothing. So we're just comparing something to 6 volts here. And trust me, that isn't going to hurt my explanation. When we first start up this triple five timer, what happens? Well, we have from the VCC pin, traveling through this resistor here, 
And electricity, instead of traveling down here, it has an easier path to travel. It will actually choose to go through the discharge pin instead and go directly to ground because through the flip-flop here, that switch is connected to ground to begin with. So electricity is basically just gonna go from the positive to ground. And it's just gonna skip this entire part right here because it's an easier path. So if that is happening, then we basically just have a ground signal traveling over on to the trigger input pin. So we have, going to this negative input of the A comparator, zero volts because it's connected to ground. So let's look at our comparator settings up here. What will this comparator output? Well, the V plus input is greater than the V minus input. Three volts is greater than zero volts. That means that the output of the comparator in letter A, that means that the output of comparator A will be high, or it will send out voltage. And whenever we get a high output out of comparator A, the switches of the flip-flop are going to switch to their down position. So this switch right here is going to move down here to a no connection, while this switch right here is going to move down to positive power instead of ground. So we flipped the switches downward in this flip-flop because the comparator letter A is sending out a high signal. Okay, so when we start up the triple five timer, essentially what happens is our output is almost instantly connected to positive power. Our output goes high. So our output is high. So what happens after all of this takes place? Well, let's go back to the start again. We have, coming from positive power, VCC through a resistor, except remember that the flip-flop is in the down state right now. So Electricity isn't going to travel through the discharge pin anymore because it is no longer connected to ground. It's connected to nothing. So it has nowhere to travel to. So instead, it'll continue to travel through this resistor here, and it will begin to charge up this capacitor right here. So for a certain amount of time as this capacitor is charging up, we will essentially have, going through this threshold pin to the positive input of the B comparator, zero volts. And then after maybe a very short amount of time, depending upon the capacitor and resistor values, it'll climb up to one volt. And then after a little bit more time, it'll climb up to maybe two volts and then three volts. And because the V plus input is less than the V minus input now, because remember V minus is at six volts, two thirds of our supply voltage, our output of this comparator stays low. So the switches aren't gonna switch to up because the output is low, it's not activating the flip-flop. So our output is essentially stuck at the high output for so long. And it's gonna be stuck there until the input of our comparator, the plus input, reaches just over six volts. So for example purposes, I'm gonna write seven volts, but in reality, it's just gonna be a tiny, tiny amount over six volts. Now the second that that happens, Comparator B is going to output a high signal because now V plus is greater than V minus. So since we have a high signal going to the switch up portion of our flip-flop, these switches that are in the down position are going to flip back to their up position again. So let me go ahead and just remove all these lines here that I have drawn. Now these switches are back in their up position because we had a high signal come to the switch up input. So because that all took time to happen, because this capacitor was charging up to get to that voltage greater than six volts, our output stayed high at VCC for some amount of time, and it just switched back to its ground connection again. So now our output has gone low. So now what's gonna happen? Again, let's begin at the beginning and see what is happening now. From VCC, we have power going through this resistor, but now it has that easy path again. It'll go through the discharge pin to ground because that's an easier path for it to take to travel. Because our capacitor is about two thirds of the way charged up, it's at about six volts, it's going to begin to discharge. And it will start to discharge basically through the trigger input right here, through the minus sign of this A comparator right here. So it's gonna begin at six volts. Well, in this case, V plus is less than V minus, so our comparator is going to output a low signal, so it's not going to make the switches go down just yet. But slowly, over time, the capacitor is going to discharge. It'll go down to 5 volts. It'll slowly go down to 4 volts. And once it gets barely below 3 volts, again, for example purposes, I'm just going to write 2 volts to make it simple. 
Once it gets below 3 volts over that short amount of time, comparator A is going to output a high signal because now V plus is greater than V minus again. So we're less than one third of our supply voltage, it's going to make the switches flip to their down position once more. So our output was at ground or low for a little bit of time, now it just switched back to high again. And this cycle is going to repeat. So at this point in our circuit, the discharge pin is now in the down position connected to nothing, so it'll begin to recharge this capacitor right here, and it will charge it until it's just over two-thirds of our supply voltage again. And when that happens, this comparator will make the switches go to their up position again. And the whole cycle is going to repeat. And because this all takes a bit of time due to the resistors and the charging of the capacitor, which I'm going to explain in just a few moments, our output stays connected to ground or low for some amount of time, and then it stays connected to VCC, or it stays high for a little bit amount of time, and it switches back and forth between that. It's an alternating cycle. So hopefully that explanation got you through how this triple five timer worked for us. I'm really hoping that I explained it well enough. If you have any questions at all, leave them down below in the comments. I or someone else will try their best to answer your question and try to get you to explain this the best we possibly can. So we have just a couple more things to explain. First of all, reset is constantly connected in our case to VCC. Basically, whenever reset goes low, so if we were to connect reset to ground, it's just going to automatically force the flip-flop to reset to the up position. And it'll stay in the up position until our reset goes high again, and it'll allow the triple five timer to function again. Okay, so how can we calculate the frequency of our triple five timer? Well, there's a really neat equation that someone created that we can figure that out with. Basically, we have frequency equal to 1.44 divided by, and I'm going to call this resistor A right here, and resistor B. So we have that divided by resistor A plus 2 times the resistor amount of B all multiplied by and we'll call the capacitance of this capacitor C. So we're going to multiply that by the farad capacitance of that right there. So the frequency in the circuit that I built is going to be 1.44 divided by both of my resistors were 4.7k ohms so I have 4,000 700 ohms plus 2 times 4,700 ohms as well. And then all of that is multiplied by my 470 microfarad capacitor. So because I had 470 microfarads, and we have to make this in the farad unit, that is equivalent to 0 0.00047 farads, I believe. And actually, I'm not going to write that F in there just to make it more readable. So if I do the calculation, I should have the frequency that my output was oscillating at. So when I do calculate that, I get my frequency to equal approximately 0.217 hertz, which is abbreviated HZ. And that basically means how many times per second is this cycle happening? So I had a very, very slow oscillation because I used such a big capacitance value. So my light wasn't even blinking on and off once per second, it was doing it even slower than that. But if we reduced the capacitance value, so if this value got lower, then our frequency would increase. Or if these resistance values got lower, then our frequency would increase. And it would be faster and faster. So you should probably try and experiment around with your resistor and capacitance values there. That way you can see all different frequencies with your triple five timer. Again, I hope I explained this all well enough for you guys. Any questions, leave them down below in the comments. This is really fun. We are getting into the meat and potatoes of this 8-bit computer series now. We just have to cover a few more basic concepts until we actually get into designing the 8-bit computer. Thanks for watching, everyone, and I'll see you guys in the next video.